What's up YouTube? It's Tim here again. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test, or the AFOQT. Uh, this video is going to be broken up into four main parts. Uh, the first is just going to be a general overview of the test, the basics of what you need to know. Uh, the second part is going to be my experience on test day. The third is going to be just some general tips I have for this test because it is kind of a unique one, um, as well as exactly how I prepared, what resources I used. And the fourth section is just going to be all about scores, how to access them, what they mean, what I got, and what I got in other scores so that you can compare it. Um, that's it. Let's just get into it. So the overview. Uh, the AFOQT is taken by uh, cadets from the Air Force Academy as well as uh, AFROTC. It's taken by civilians and enlisted members uh, who are just looking to commission in the future. Um, and although this is aimed at college level students for the most part or people who have already finished their college degrees, um, most of the content, actually all the content in it is high school level. So no matter what your education status is, you should already have a baseline knowledge of everything that's going to be on the test. Now that doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, for one, the timing on the test is pretty insane. Um, especially combined with the fact that it is a paper test, it is on Scantron, uh, you only have so much time to fill out all those bubbles. Um, with a lot of these uh, questions having less than, I don't know, 20 seconds to be answered, bubbling that Scantron is going to be kind of hard. Uh, so you really have to manage your time on this test. Um, also, there are some subtests that you will have never seen before. You, you won't um, probably have run into some subtests like this. I know I said most of the test is stuff you've seen before. There's going to be some entirely new content, um, but that's only really going to be important for people who want rated positions. If you're going in there um, unrated, just kind of a general officer stuff, uh, then the stuff you have to focus on is really just going to be the main, you know, SAT, ACT stuff. Uh, same as always. But if you do want a rated position, uh, the subtests that factor into your scores um, are going to have some wild ones like block counting, instrument comprehension, aviation knowledge. Um, I'll put the subtests up here right now and then you can see exactly how much time you have for them. There are 12. Uh, you do them in quick succession right after another. And also you can't go back on the test. So each section is timed individually. Once you've completed that section, you move on to the next one. Uh, nobody's allowed to go back into their booklet and start filling out bubbles for a different section. Uh, that's what the proctors are there for, walking around making sure you're not doing that. Anyway, that's the test. Uh, now let's get into some tips to help you guys out. So tips for passing the test. Number one, get a book. The book I got was the Moonpoint AFOQT uh, Study Guide. I think that's what it's called. I haven't looked at it in a minute. Um, anyway, I think it's only like $10 on Amazon. And the most important thing it has is just practice tests. Uh, since I said before, the content isn't that super hard. Uh, you, don't, you don't need a college degree to understand the content of the test. However, um, especially for the rated positions, the subtests that go into that, those things are hard unless you've practiced them before. And it really benefits you to practice them as much as possible, so that they're second nature. So that when you're on the test itself, you're not second guessing yourself. Uh, the problem is, for a lot of those, you're only going to get a couple seconds per question. So if you're spending the first couple questions just trying to get a feel for it, you're probably going to be going too slow, honestly. Um, so that's tip number two. Practice, practice, practice the test. This isn't a test that you study for, this is a test you practice for. Of course, if you're a little shaky on uh, your basic math, uh, verbal analogies and stuff, then studying that will be useful to you. Um, but the bulk of your studying, especially if you're going for the rated jobs, is going to be just practicing uh, those other more obscure um, subtests. Uh, which brings me to tip number three, decide what kind of job you want in the, uh, in the Air Force first. Um, if you want to go rated, then look at, for your job, look at which subtests matter the most. If you're going to go pilot, if you're going to do something else, just look at the subtests so you know what to study. Um, if you just want to be like kind of a general officer, you don't want to go rated, you're going to go non-rated, um, then it's not really going to be a benefit to you to spend all of your time, say, studying the, the FAA manual to try to max out aviation knowledge. That stuff's not going to help you on any of your, your academic aptitude sections. So it's kind of pointless to do. 
And honestly, um, unless you know a lot about planes already, even if you're going for pilot, I scored completely fine on pilot. I scored 87 on the pilot section. I never even opened up the FAA manual like my book suggested. Um, I never opened it up in the first place. So obviously you can make up for it on the other branches of the test that are way easier to practice and take way less time. So really prioritize which sections you need to study for, depending on what kind of job you want, okay? And tip number four, not really about preparation, but when you're on the test. Remember, it is a quick test. Uh, work fast. Um, honestly, it's gonna be better to move through the test uh, than to make sure you're getting every single question right. So what I would recommend, especially in the academic portions, because you're gonna have a little bit more time on those, uh, of course, like, um, block counting and the uh, table reading, you're not going to have any time to go back. By the time you get to the end, that's when they're going to call it. Uh, I didn't see anybody work fast enough to, you know, wait around at the end of the test for people to finish. On those sections, it's literally a couple seconds. It's just you look, you fill in the scantron. You look, you fill in the scantron. Uh, but for the academic ones, there's a little bit more than like a minute per question. So you have time to employ some test taking uh, strategies. So what I would suggest is go through the test kind of at a decent pace. Answer all the easy ones. The ones that you have absolutely no idea on, just put C, mark it in the Scantron. And the ones that you're unsure about, you think, well, you know, this is a math one and I think I know the math for it, but I'm not certain I'll get the right answer from that one. Mark those. And once you get to the end of the test, having done all the easy ones and basically skipping and just putting C for all the hard ones, Prioritize, come up with a game plan for how you're gonna attack the rest of them. Don't waste your time on the ones where you have to do a ton of math and you're not sure if you're gonna get the answer right at the end. Focus the ones where you know you have to weigh uh, the certainty of getting the answer right to the amount of time it's gonna take you to arrive at the answer. And that's how you should come up with your game plan for attacking the rest of the questions when it comes to, you know, that's actually for most of the tests, other than the ones that you have like less than 10 seconds for. Like you can apply that to the verbal one, uh, the verbal analogies I mean, the word knowledge, you can apply that to the math knowledge. Um, just do a, a strategy similar to that. Alright, so my test day. Um, I'm active duty, so I just scheduled it through my education office, I think a month in advance. I don't think I had to do that much time, but it was, it, you know, it's COVID, so I wanted to be careful. Um, they asked me if I had taken it before. That's really the only thing they cared about is if I had taken it before. Just because you are only allowed to take it twice in your life. Uh, they don't want to waste time getting you to the test date only to find out that you already had two on file. Uh, so I told them no and they scheduled me a date. Um, so on the day of the test, I think I went in a little bit early. I got there, I got some coffee. I've been to the education office a million times uh, doing CLEPS and stuff, so I was already familiar with the testing services there. I knew how long it would take to get there in the morning. Um, but I still wanted to practice a couple things like the blocks, the instrument reading, just so it was fresh in my head before I went in there. Um, so I just got some coffee and waited in the lobby and just kind of flipped through it on my phone and did that. Uh, anyway, we all got let in at about 7.45 and that's when they told us there was going to be a delay. And the reason for the delay was uh, the civilians that were going to take the test there um, were having difficulty getting on base. They called ahead and the proctors were okay with it. They asked anybody if they needed uh, to take the test immediately you know, if they had something to do in four hours. Um, everybody said they were okay with waiting, so we waited for them. Um, you might not be that lucky, uh, and if they were active duty, there's a 0% chance they would have been allowed to test that day. Uh, it just happens to be that if you're a civilian, sometimes there are unexpected delays when it comes to getting on base. Uh, so if you are a civilian and you want to take the test, and you have to take it on a military base, keep in mind that you're going to have to arrive way early than you think you do. Uh, first of all, getting onto a military base just takes a long time because of the traffic. They have to wave everybody through. Uh, and as a visitor, you're probably going to have to get out and go to the security um, section or security area, uh, wait in line you know, physically, then get in your car, then wait back in line. The whole process might take you 30 minutes. So prepare for that. Come way early, especially if you're a civilian. Um, Anyway, they asked us a couple questions as they were passing out the scantrons and stuff. Uh, it is a paper test. There's a lot of different papers involved with it. Um, so it was kind of like a ceremonious process, you know, getting 
getting everything situated. It kind of took like 20 or 30 minutes before we even began the test after the civilians got there, which is a little weird. I kind of figured I'd just get in there, start the test, turn it in, and leave. But um, anyway, they started asking people questions. Um, I don't know if this was information they really needed, but they asked everybody the same set of questions anyway. Um, they asked people for their rank, I think their time in service. Uh, they asked people for uh, their highest level of education. And I was just kind of surprised at like uh, the, the difference that we had in, in the classroom or the testing center, which looks like a classroom anyway. Um, anywhere between like E2 to E9 were there. And anybody from just high school education to multiple master's degrees, I mean, I was there, I just had an associate degree. I kind of felt like I had zero education compared to these master sergeants that were just collecting master degrees. Um, but anyway, after a minute, or two, or 15, uh, whenever the civilians got all situated and stuff, um, we began the test. And right away, I did not expect to have to rush as much as I did to get through this test. I'd taken the practice test, but the difference between taking the practice test and taking the real test is on the practice test, I kind of took it section by section. I was like, okay, this section, I only get 20 minutes. So I would do that 20 minute section, then I would take a breather. I would do some other things, I would come back to my practice test, and then I would go to the next section. It's not like that in the test center. You're going to be taking those one after another. As soon as you finish, as soon as everybody finishes, or the, basically until the time goes down to zero, you're into the next one. And you're going to be slower that way over time. You're going to get a little bit more fatigue as you're going. So I would suggest when you're doing those practice tests, really simulate the way the test is actually going to be. Um, try to get into that actual three and a half hour block instead of stretching it four or five or doing it on multiple days. Uh, it'll help you a lot more uh, to prepare for the level of stress that you're going to be under while you're doing this test because it is a stressful test and it's kind of a painful test. I mean you're doing that Scantron the entire time. Honestly my hands started hurting halfway through um, and some of the older people were <laughs> a little bit more vocal uh, kind of, I don't know, grunting <laughs> as they went through their tests. I don't know, but just be prepared for that as well, that you're going to be uh, filling in bubbles, hundreds of bubbles, and you're going to take the entire three hours to do it. Um, I looked around a couple times as I was filling out the test, especially if I had finished a section early. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, I did notice a couple people trying to flip through the Scantron, going back to old sections. Uh, I never felt like I had enough time to do it, and honestly, I wouldn't remember the questions or how to answer them going back after we moved on. Uh, but there was definitely some attempt by other people to try to do it, and the proctors weren't very aware of the situation. Uh, I think most of them were just reading during the test until their timer went off. So, I mean, get away what you can get away with, but remember, you can only take this test twice, and I'm assuming if you get caught cheating, it's going to be just that one time you're not going to get a second chance, and you'll probably never commission. So, keep that in mind. Um, I believe we got a break somewhere in the middle for about 15 minutes. Uh, oh, additionally, uh, this is important to mention, they were calling out when we had a minute and 30 seconds left. And I don't remember if that was exactly like written on the test, so I don't know if every testing center is going to do that, or if they're going to do it the same way. Uh, but our guys uh, were pretty spot on with telling us exactly how much time we had left uh, when it was coming down to the wire so that we knew when we had to start just filling in bubbles, uh, which happens to everybody in that test. I mean, as you're going to see, I did score pretty well, and there were times where I got to the end of the test, and there was a couple that I didn't answer, and I just had to fill in the bubbles at the end, and then right as I was done, time was called, and I just had to throw it on my pencil there. So don't think that, oh, I didn't have time to finish that section, I must have failed. Remember, it's a percentile test. You're compared against the raw scores of, you know, hundreds of other people. You're really just competing against them. You're not competing against the test. And the average person's also struggling just as hard as you are. So keep that in mind. Um, I was able to get off work for my test, so I didn't have to go into work immediately after that. Uh, I don't know if you're active duty. That might be the case for you. They might still expect you to come in. Uh, but basically, as soon as I was done with my test, um, or we'd all finish the test because there's no finishing early than anybody else, or earlier than anybody else, I mean. 
Uh, once we had finished, they basically said, this is the website you're gonna go to to check out your scores. They should be there in a week or two. And then that was it. Uh, in a week or two, I did see my scores and uh, yeah, that's my experience with the test. Uh, let's move on to the scores now. All right, for scores, uh, usually I just go to Reddit to find these things. Uh, the Air Force portal has changed so much, uh, even in the last like year, um, and they keep moving around links and stuff. So if you were told to go to uh, the Randolph link, that one no longer works. Uh, instead, you have to go to this uh, AF Mill one, and for some reason, it'll only work in Firefox. So I don't know. I've tried almost every other browser that I possibly could, and Firefox was the only one that would actually let me uh, get to the site. So if you're having a difficulties getting into it that's probably it's probably just a browser uh, let's go back twice uh, so that link takes you exactly to this page or, or it should <laughs> hopefully it takes you to this page just hit OK uh, then you have to put in uh, your information exactly as it appeared on the test so if you input any of your stuff wrong in the bubbles on your test uh, try to remember <laughs> what you did because that's gonna be the only way to get to this uh, if you like made some mistake and bubbled in the wrong thing for your last name or social security number. Uh, and remember uh, your testing location. Um, if your base has multiple uh, testing centers, you have to remember the number. Uh, if not, you can just click on the name. Don't save. So here are my scores. Uh, and, and the easiest way to compare this to another test is to look at this uh, academic aptitude section. Now to give you a comparison for other tests I've taken, um, I scored a 96 on the ASVAB, and I scored a 30, which was about 95th percentile on the ACT. So obviously the score is, <laughs> you know, about the same as I've been getting on every other test I've ever taken. Uh, the uh, pilot, CSO, and ABM ones, uh, this is uh, Combat Systems Officer and Air Battle Manager. Uh, these are for uh, specific jobs. Uh, these are the rated positions. If you're going non-rated, uh, it doesn't even matter what you score on these. Uh, everybody, however, has to score at least 15 on verbal and 10 on quantitative. Uh, but the pilot, CSO, and ABM sections are really just the really specific uh, subtests at the end of the AFOQT. Uh, that is shown here. Uh, this website's cool. Um, it kind of tells you how much time you have between each one of the tests. Uh, I think we had a little bit more rest time. It's saying admin time. This is about, you can compare this to the rest time between between the tests. Uh, 10 minutes to begin and then one minute between each test, then 10 minute break. Uh, another 15 minute break after uh, the inventories, which are, uh, they, they don't really matter towards the test. They just are designed, I guess, to fatigue your hand. I don't know. Uh, and then the X's show you uh, if these matter towards any specific uh, category. Or composite score so all of them matter towards your academic and all of them are important for the first one for verbal and quantitative because you have to get a minimum of 15 on this and 10 on the other uh, so you have to score well in the first you know third of the test the last third uh, none of these apply to academic verbal or quantitative uh, they're just the rated jobs so if you want to go for one specific rated job, uh, just look at this, whichever one you need to do. Uh, and if you're going non-rated, none of these tests really matter for you. You could uh, probably get zeros on all of them and still get your job. Uh, but here are the composite scores that you need to pass. Uh, we've already discussed that you need 15 and 10 for every position on verbal and quantitative. Uh, but for pilot, you need to score 25 on that and 10 in CSO. For CSO, you need to score 25 on that and 10 in pilot. And ABM, you just need a 25 in that, in addition to your verbal and quantitative scores. Simple enough. Um, and this breakout just shows you which uh, tests, which subtests you have to focus on uh, to get the score you need in the uh, composite area that you're looking for. Uh, so academic aptitude is just a combination of all the academic ones, verbal analogies, arithmetic reasoning, uh, word knowledge, math knowledge, uh, so it's just a combination of these two basically um, and then pilot if you want to be a pilot you're gonna have to do math knowledge uh, instrument comprehension table reading and aviation information uh, as you can see aviation information uh, is probably the hardest thing to study and it only applies to pilots and ABM 
So if you have no interest in either of those jobs, then you could probably just skip reading anything about aviation information. However, uh, it's a pretty big component of pilot, so keep that in mind. Um, see if I missed anything. Guess that's it. That's the video. Thanks for watching. Um, I do stream on Twitch every night now, uh, just as I'm about to get out of the Air Force. If you want to watch it, that's cool. Uh, I'll put a link in there. You can go follow it. Um, anyway, like I said, thanks for watching. Have a nice day. See you later.